Mark Finnegan is an Irish tennis player. He is a former college tennis coach in the United States, and now he's the owner of All Sports Recruitment. So we're going to get into all that in due course. But Mark, firstly, I just want to ask you, why did you go to America? What, what was that all about? I, I think, you know, it still is the case today where, you know, I think most people think the best opportunity I have to be the best version of myself is comes from America because it's there's a bigger pot of players and you feel like there's the, maybe the cards are not stacked as quite as much against you over there. So all my you know, my peers and, and uh, players that uh, were, were older than me that I would have looked up to would have always come back saying they had great experiences over there. And mm. it was kind of always my goal from the age of very early age of 13 or 14 was to eventually end up in the States on a scholarship. You know, when you're, we didn't have an M50 back in the day. We went across the Wicklow Mountains uh, and up, up into the Dublin Mountains to get to, to Kiltiernan Tennis Club or uh, yeah. for an indoor court. And so, you know, you'd be on the road an hour and 15 minutes and you'd have your lunch, you'd get dressed in the back of the car. Sometimes on a Wednesday, my mom might bring me for a McDonald's before we played tennis. Like, yeah. So it was just an overall grind. Um, I remember taking off 20, 30 minutes off school a little bit early from Newbridge to set off on the journey, you know. Yeah. And then my dad would pick me up in the evenings and it'd be pitch dark and you'd get home and sneak in 30 minutes of study and then yeah. go to bed, right? So... so was that with the Casey's up there? Who, who was running that up in Kiltair? Yeah, it, it was. The Casey's were probably at an all-time peak level of, of doing performance tennis at that stage. Really? Owen, Paul, Connor, um, all together, uh, running yeah. a little academy up there on four indoor hard courts, which, was, which at the time was, was like gold dust, you know? Unbelievable. Um, yeah, and there was a great crew up there. It almost felt like a, like a little national tennis academy up there because... Most yeah. of the good players were were, 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 were up there at the time and um, mm. and and those and, and those coaches were tough. They they loved on us and they were great to us, but they were also tough on us too. And yeah. for anyone who knows Kiltiernan, there's quite a few uh, little uh, uh, like hills in Kiltiernan Tennis Club. So <laughs> you'd miss five shots and you'd be you'd be doing a mile up the hill like so <laughs> Yeah. And and it's no coincidence that Owen himself went on to, to do great things. I believe Paul was a big influence on him in, on, in tennis wise. So to have all three of them is, is a, I'm jealous of you personally. But anyway, um, what were your first impressions of the States once you got there? You know, my experience was I was recruited actually by a different coach when I went to Georgia Southern and then that coach moved on um, to another university. So the coach that actually picked me up from the airport was a brand new coach uh, at, to the university. So we had zero relationship. We didn't know each other from Adam. He was a brand new coach, uh, had very little experience. Um, actually, later on in life, we became very good friends. He, and he actually coached at a country club right next to the, one of the universities I coached at. But we had a bit of a, a rough relationship. Really? Uh, I was very high maintenance, uh, very demanding, probably wasn't very um, uh, easy to deal with. Um, really? And then in turn, you know, I don't know if he was able to really know um, how to manage someone like myself. So... And, um, you know, I remember simple little things of like, um, I would say, uh, um, GD, um, which wouldn't be a nice word in America um, to say. And I was just a habit of mine that I had said it before I'd gone over there. And ultimately, every time I would say GD, um, he'd send me off on my mile run. Really? And I'd, yeah. And, and I'd be like, oh, I'm so sorry. And then I'd say like, you know, so it's funny, uh, you know, my first probably year there was was good i embraced the culture i loved the culture it was in georgia southern and south georgia so it was quite quite um um bible belt um, and okay. but once i learned kind of how to understand and, and enjoy the culture i i really enjoyed my my, my my first two years at georgia southern so then then you went to memphis is that what happened so then yeah so then um i transferred to memphis and uh I was just kind of looking for a different experience. I, I'd loved my time at Georgia Southern. Probably me and the coach didn't see eye to eye. Right. Um, right. So I ultimately then found a, a really great coach who'd actually spend a lot of summers in Ireland playing this Irish summer circuit. So nice. he was very familiar with a lot of the same Irish people who I knew. And um, I actually used a recruiting service. And back when recruitment agencies were just starting up, um, they helped me through the process. Okay. And they really then emphasized um, some of the things that were important to me in the recruitment process that I wasn't even aware of. 
And that really helped me identify this coach at Memphis, who was actually the assistant at the time, but he really, he was the one who recruited me. Uh, and that was the coach that went on to be the head coach then that I worked for at Memphis for all my years and was like a father figure for me. Well, it's, a, it's amazing how all things are connected. Like you, you are now doing what you availed of all those, all those years ago. But can you just tell me, why did you stay in the States? Because not a lot stay. So you did for 15 years or whatever it was. So why, why did you do that? Well, I mean, well, the first thing is, is, is I've, I, after I transferred, like it was never ever questioned me wanting to come back to Ireland. Really? Um, yeah, I always knew there was there was something better out there in the states than going back to Ireland at that age. I think it's a great age to be in the states. I think the eighteen to twenty two year olds, even twenty three, twenty four, America is a phenomenal place where I, I feel like you you know anything's possible there, and there's mm. nobody to get in your way, and you mm. can create your own little like destiny of what you wanted. So I was very attracted to that. Um, I also met my my um, now wife at the very okay. end of my time in America, and she actually did come back and live in Ireland with me for a brief period of time um, before we went back again to the States because she hadn't finished her education. Okay. So, um, well, once we got back to the States, you know, I kind of had a, had a goal. I always wanted to be a college coach at some stage, and I had a great opportunity to get back in um, as the assistant at Memphis when, a, when a, an opening occurred there. Um, mm. And, and you know, we just kind of, we really enjoyed the, the first few years of her life in America and, and we got her education out of the way at Memphis, so she graduated too. And, um, and then we just led us to basically just keep moving from university to university until we kind of were ready then to kind of raise our family and, and get our boys to see what it's like to be back in Ireland. So did you, it sounds like you are a firm believer in the American dream. Is that oh yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> I know. I mean, I'm a big believer in you're going to make the best of no matter where you're at. So, yeah. um, you know, there's lots of positives about being in Ireland. Um, there's so many things that we do so good over here. And there's so many good things that they do good in America. In my opinion, you just got to get the best of each of wherever you're at. Um, mm. And I think, look, I think that comes down to your mindset. I think I probably was a very closed mindset and fixed mindset of person before I left uh, for America. Uh, I only really very narrow minded view of how I view things. And then, you know, once I got to America, there's so many different opinions. There's so many different ways of looking at things. And I think everybody in America is very good at respecting what you believe and what you think. They mightn't agree with you, but you're entitled to your own opinion and you can be your own person. So um, I think I learned then to, to really do a better job of, of, of respecting other people's opinions. And, and, and that, I think that's a really, really attractive thing about America. And to, to have a self-awareness, like you mentioned, the thing that you said that your coach didn't like and that's that's a really important lesson I think to learn because you, you you while yes people will tolerate you they will up to a point as, as long as you like you kind of respect you mind your business to a certain extent and that that's very important to realize especially uh, in the American South I think it's fair to say you have to know your place so I, I think you learned that uh, and and one really cool thing is that you can pass these things on uh, to your to your clients now, fundamentally, like a big, a big thing you talk about is team uh, being an asset to the team. You know, it's not all about winning matches necessarily, beating the number one from uh, Columbus State University or whatever. You know what I mean? So, can you talk a little bit about how you can blend in and and be as valuable as you possibly can if you do decide to go to America? Yeah, I mean, the, the thing is, is like I said, is is when you're on a part of a team, they ultimately don't need everybody to win on the, on the same day. What they need everyone to do is to do their jobs. And whatever their job on the day is, if you do it to the best of your ability, then ultimately the team will end up coming out ahead. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, we'd be on a bus journey for 10 hours home from a match. And you could be the guy who had a, a ranked singles win, but yet the team lost. And you'd be sitting in the bus and, and yeah, you're happy, but really... You don't really get to share that joy because ultimately the team didn't have a win, you know, and um, whereas you could have maybe been the person who didn't win your match, but didn't lose your match. And then the team ended up winning. And then everybody's sitting there complimenting you because the fact that you were you, you didn't get off the court and you didn't yes. allow the other team to get one point up. And and, you know, that comes back to value. It's like, OK, you know, there's so many ways you can create value. We I always talked about people is, is value is 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 comes in so many different ways and 
And if you can figure out what your best attributes are and what you bring to that element of the team, then you'll be valued more than just a tennis player. And mm -hmm. if you're valued more than ten just a tennis player and just more than just winning a tennis match, then ultimately you can ride the peaks and valleys of, of college tennis. Because if anyone knows college tennis or college sports in general, it doesn't matter how you feel, they're going to put you on the tennis court. Mm -hmm. So if you're feeling at your worst possible if you're in your worst possible place as a tennis player, you still have to go ahead and compete. Yes. Um, and you, but you could also be on fire and you could be in the zone and you could go on an eight match win streak and you could be feeling amazing, but that's not going to last. Eventually mm. in your four years, you're going to go through a tough time. So I always big on, on okay, identify your value. Like how can we increase your value? So when you go over there, then people see you as just more than just a person who wins a tennis match. Okay, so in order to create your value, apart from in a match winning or, or staying out there longer. How do you make yourself a valuable teammate? Well, look, I, th I think you're, you're a pretty good example, right? So, okay, well, well, I, I, maybe I bluff it well, Mark. I, I, I think I'm doing a good job of faking it, maybe. Well, you've obviously got great communication skills and you're extremely likable and you're able to, to get your point across. And, you, and I definitely know that you, you, you care about people. Mm. Like, so, you know, for a fact, if you were on my team, what I would say is, OK, you know what? Fergus might necessarily have been in the top six of the lineup, but for sure, I know after the match, he's going to give a very valuable opinion of how everything went mm -hmm. uh, do it in a very constructive way. He's not going to be the guy who's just going to be sitting over in the, in the corner because he's not playing the tennis match. He's going to be there che cheering and yelling for his teammates. Mm. Uh, and then also as well as like, you know what, you'd probably be able to help me break down maybe a couple of the performances of the players that would be able to help me then communicate to the player yeah. of what, what they could do to improve for the next time. So, like, you know, I would say, like, every player's got something that they do really, really well off the tennis court um, or off the field. You just got to find it and you got to be able to then know how to, to use it for its positives rather yes. than, than, than necessarily its... Uh, it's Achilles heel, right? Yes, it gets in the way of the tennis. So, well, to, co to come back to Ireland for a second and, and the top level. So you said yourself, the logistics, the, the facilities and the, the structures were probably more sophisticated in America uh, when you were 16, 17, 18, right? So can you talk about, uh, about why we don't produce top tennis players in Ireland uh, consistently? Look, I, I think nobody would argue, and, and the first thing is obviously the surface. Um, you know, we've gotten three clay courts in Nace now, which has been um, a, a blessing to me, to be honest, because, you know, on a wet Astro, like I've tried to teach a tennis lesson in Ireland on a wet Astro. It, it's extremely difficult to actually teach a productive lesson on it. Really? Um, I find it very difficult and I'm a little spoiled because of the clay and we have yeah. an indoor bubble too. So the indoor bubble on, on the Astro plays a little bit more like a hard. So, um, but you know, for example, I was down in Munster a couple of, uh, of weeks ago and I was doing something with Munster tennis and the balls, th th they're terrible balls because the balls are so wet and soggy because there's no uh -huh. point in them having new balls because they're just going to get ruined in, in one minute. And um, you really can't develop good, um, like in terms of, of, of shot decision making. Yes. Um, sometimes even the, the decision making of your shots is on a, a wet astro is the exact opposite of what a, a player should actually choose, right? And <laughs> um, so that's that's definitely a challenge. But I, I also don't think it's something that's 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 maybe not necessarily the, the whole reason of why we're not producing a player. And um, you know, I, I I also think that the, the, the producing a top hundred player in the world, <laughs> it takes a lot of luck. It takes a lot of resources. Um, it takes a freak, freakish athlete, mm -hmm. uh, and then it also takes an, an athlete that ultimately um, is willing to sacrifice everything in the rest of their life to, for that to be the for it to be the case. Yes. Um, so Correct. look, like when we talk about not producing a top hundred player in the world, it's 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 not like that's shameful that yes. we haven't done that. Um, now, what I think I've said this, another person I did an interview with was like, I think is very healthy compared to the rest of the world is our tennis activity and how much tennis we play at a social level. And okay. um, now I think, I think that there's, 
it, this is just my opinion, but I feel like if the clubs can take more ownership of the players' development instead of maybe the, the overall national governing body the, 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 saying that that's their full responsibility, then I think our clubs are the most uh, successful and, and, and the, mo- the healthiest. Yeah. And, and they could all be part of a player's journey. Then I'm not saying that that's the answer to a problem, but I'm, I'm thinking that, you know, you're from Monkstown. You see how close the network is there in Monkstown. Like, imagine if everybody in Monkstown was getting behind, uh, mm. for example, a Connor Gannon, right? Yeah. And they were helping a little bit on the funding side of Connor Gannon. Um, and then ultimately, Connor Gannon one day ended up going to Wimbledon. I get and you. then uh, there'd be a 2,000 people from Monkstown going over to Wimbledon to see him, and they'd all feel like they were part of the journey. So yes. um, that's just my little opinion, and, and that's kind of just coming from the side of, of college tennis that I've seen so many good college tennis players, a couple of them that I've been fortunate enough to be on the tennis court with and coach, that they've received funding after they finished their college experience from people who were involved with the college programs that I was at. I get you. Because they felt a part of that journey and they watched that player from their freshman year to their senior year. Yeah. So um, you feel it, you feel that connection with them. I, I know what you mean. Uh, yeah. And look, just you know, we obviously know Julian really well, and yes. uh, like even players like Shadeed Lowed, like like Shadeed is is a, f- a freakishly good athlete and a freakishly good competitor, and she's loves tennis and is obsessed with it, and she's done phenomenal, you know, but. Financially, has she got enough to keep her going for five or ten more years? Can she go out on and really, truly do everything she wants to do without thinking yeah. of money? Probably yes. not, right? Yeah. No, that's that's the the harsh reality, I suppose. Do you think that? Uh, well, Ju- I'll give you a, a, a view here from from an authority, and I'll see what you think. Judy Murray has said uh, that tennis is still too elitist. Uh, so, do you think that that's true in Ireland? I know we, we kind of half touched on things related to this but we haven't really dealt with that question and it's a big question like the 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 culmination of irish junior tennis is in dublin six in fitzwilliam lawn tennis club which is a very very expensive place to to become a part of and it's uh it's very hard to to get into that kind of circle uh if you're if you're not already in it right and if your parents aren't in it and that that's just one example so that's not all of Irish tennis, obviously, but it's it's a big part of it. So, what do you think of the of of the the elitism? Does it exist uh, as as far as you can see, uh, and in your experience going back to your junior your junior days? Well, I mean, and the thing is, it 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 does exist, but it's it, I think it's getting less and less. Um, and look, for example, Fitzwilliam, I owe Fitzwilliam everything, and um, because I was fortunate enough to have honorary membership there as a junior. And when I went to, to, to school, my final two years in Leeson Street, I was able to go practice in Fitzwilliam every morning before I went down to Leeson Street. And it probably saved my tennis ability for those two years, right? Yeah. Um, so in one way, in one aspect, it's like, I, I don't know, there's still a little bit of that. I think I enjoy the fact that Fitzwilliam and some of these clubs still embrace the history and the tradition of tennis. Um, and I think that. I think it's so hard to balance that history and and tradition with the elitism. Does that make sense? Because mm-hmm. they kind of come hand in hand. Um, but I also think that we're we are moving away from that. I do think that it's coming from America, where there's public tennis courts everywhere you go, yes. and a tennis court is so accessible. That still is kind of a little bit strange to me. Where in Ireland. Um, you know, you still have the only place to play tennis would be you have to pay to be a member to be a cl- of a club. Mm-hmm. Correct. And that is that is kind of a little bit strange to me because you're still then saying to people that uh, yeah, you still have to have money to play tennis. And mm. um, and look, I I think I don't know, but I, I definitely I like the fact that we've gotten our coaches have done a good job, and I actually think our coaches are very good on on the technical side of tennis here in Ireland compared to a lot of other countries. I think we, mm. our coaches do a fantastic job. I think we've gotten a little bit too much towards um, teaching and not competing. Um, and look, I, I, I'm trying to walk that fine line myself too as well, because how do I teach you how to be a good team player, but also not take away from your, your competing, you know? I, I remember um, Justin Clark said exactly that. He said, Irish juniors are technically too perfect. Like they're, 
like that's not everything, you know, but but we we do focus. That's a fascinating thing to hear, you know, that because you obviously think oh, technique is really important and it is. But at the end of the day, you got to get out there and 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 be in difficult situations uh, in matches. So and that's where the great players are made, isn't it? Well, yeah, what I'd love to see a little bit is like you do need that technical uh, stuff at the very beginning and it will come back to help you. Like the ages of eight to 12 and, and even even some as younger at this stage, if you can get that technical um, base underneath you, that there's, there's, that's perfect. And there should be a reason for you to go and, and do a technical session of your strokes, obviously, from time to time. It's mm-hmm. when you become like dependent on your yeah. technical sessions that um, and you start going into two or three a week, then that's starting to become like an obsession almost. Yeah. Um, so look, or something, yeah. Yeah, look, and, and once again, it's like, you know, we have this thing called a NACE, it's called Next Gen NACE, and, and what I've done is I've actually incorporated uh, teaching and group sessions, but I've made sure I've, I've prioritized competing over it. So yes. they're supposed to go and they're supposed to play their league match for NACE, and then as part of that, they can get some ball striking and some, some lessons on teamwork. And I, but but I, I, if someone came to me and said, look, I'm not playing the league match because I want to go to the session, I'm like, no, no chance. You play the league match first and then you put the session second. Nice. Um, and I think, I think if we can get a little bit more of that weekend team um, competing mindset, I ultimately think is hopefully you'll keep people loving the sport longer. And yeah. if you keep the people loving the sport longer at a high level, then you have more people competing at, uh, for longer periods of time at a high level, which then increases the chances of you finding that one player who's able to get lucky and have the resources mm-hmm. to be able to to become the you know top hundred in the world. Yeah, you know? well, I love I, that. Sounds really healthy and nice. Nice does seem like a, a wonderful environment. So there, so does Monkstown too, as well. By well, the way, no, it is. Yeah, um, but but you're clearly a big asset to, to Nice. Um, the education system, Mark, in Ireland. Is, is very, very good. I think it's fair to say. It doesn't cost any money, practically, to go to college at uh, Trinity or UCD or NUI Galway or University College Cork or wherever. If you go to Belfast, I think you'd pay a bit more. But why would anyone uh, take, the, take the hit, whether it's a financial one or the risk of going to America for college? Uh, why should they consider that when we have such a good system in Ireland? Why do you think that's worth doing? Yeah, and it's one I definitely have thought about a lot. And it comes down to, I think, for me, uh, I look back and I say the experience um, and getting yourself outside the box. Just um, And here's one that actually, <laughs> I think that my goal is to help change this. Is When a college athlete comes back from America, the experience that you had, Fergus, of your time management, of doing your sport, academics, and social at a really high level, okay? That's preparing you for life. It's preparing Mm. you for the business world. It's preparing you to go into a very, very tough work environment, okay? Because from the moment that you wake up in America as a student athlete, and from the moment you go to sleep, you're being productive. Wouldn't you agree? You should be, yeah, I suppose. (laughs) But, you know, I and I personally think maybe, you know, I don't know, I don't have the experience in Ireland as a student, but I would say it's a little bit more laid back and relaxed mm-hmm. um, when it comes to time management, when it comes to, to, and I could be wrong on that, but in terms of, of how you're structured from the moment you wake up to the moment you go to sleep. Mm-hmm. So I think that the American experience is when you come back here, the only thing is, is people don't really know what the student athlete does over there, right? Mm-hmm. So my goal is to actually be able to help when you transition back over here, is to help lobby a little bit more for you to know that these are the, the value things that you gained in America Yeah. that makes you more employable. And, okay. you know, my sister owns a very successful recruitment company that she places people in the recruiters in the recruiting companies, right? And she's got contracts with Facebook and Google. So I hear her conversations. I'm in the same office and mm. I'm hearing what the recruiters and these companies are wanting from people. Okay. And yes. and they're not, yeah, a degree is great and you have to have it and a master's is, is even better, but they're ultimately looking for people with with these skills 
that are able to be good team players and to be able to work in good team environments and to be able to to know their strengths. Um, and so these are the conversations that they're having with the interviewers and interviewees, yeah. right? Um, mm. And so ultimately, I look back on my college coaching days and I actually think that things that you were learning in your in your college journey as a student athlete all come back to help you then to be actually a really good asset to a company or or a place where you're working. One thing I will say, I don't know if, if this is kind of, you don't hear people talking about this out loud, I think, but uh, the, the reality is that in Ireland, well, I'll say two things about social life, I think, because I have experience of both. Uh, in America, as soon as you get there, you're you're probably going to socialize a lot with your team. So you're automatically in a, a group where uh, you're going to be taken care of in a, in a sense. So that I think that's good for your sense of belonging and your mental health fundamentally. The other thing about being a college athlete is that you're drug tested or you could be drug tested at any time. You are not allowed to take uh, certain substances as an athlete. And the fact of the matter is that there's a huge amount of uh, drug taking in Ireland right now. And some people say that's fine. OK, but um, I don't think it's a very healthy way to, to live your life. And you literally cannot do that as an athlete in America, because if you get tested, you're sent and, and you're, you fail the test, you lose some of your scholarship, you're suspended. They, it's it's not a good situation. So there's a kind of a, an innocence to the social scene uh, as a college athlete. Well, yeah, you might still go out and do your partying and mingling with people. Uh, there's a, I suppose you're protected from a certain part of it. I, th I think I think that's worth knowing, I personally. But anyway, um, um, I would say it comes more down to two as well as is, is when you're a student athlete, you have a purpose and you have a focus to your day every yeah. single time you wake up. And yeah, you don't want to let people down, right? Mm -hmm. You you know, yeah. and look, I had one guy who, who he was at the peak of his college tennis playing. He had the best win of his life. He, he was turning around himself as a tennis player more than I've ever seen a student athlete. I came back on the Monday morning, I, I got a phone call <laughs> and he failed a test. Yeah. And, and, um, you know, that was um, like, unfortunately, then that his whole journey of whole everything, how it went for him, it changed. It, it changed his pathway. Um, right. Yeah. So it's like, look, I, I, I think that happened very, 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 I think probably once once in my whole time there in 11 years. But, you know, I think the goal is, is when you're over in America is you should be there because you want to maximize the experience. And by maximizing experiences, when you wake up every morning, you should be excited to go about doing your day, mm. which is going to be very productive. Um, and it, yeah. You don't need other stimulants, let's say, because you're you're busy doing things. Um, that's what I think. Yeah. Now, look, they, 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 every, they party the same way they party in the rest of the world, right? Mm. But ultimately, when you're at that party, you've got eight or nine teammates that are basically, if you're going to make a bad decision, they're going to make you aware of, Hey, look, that decision's gonna come back to hurt you, or yeah. so you might want to think twice about that. Um, yeah. You know, I want to paint a picture for people who aren't familiar with tennis of what does it take to get to the level uh, necessary to have the chance to go to America. So what I said to my brother was, it, he said, "Oh, well, the coaching is so expensive," and I said, "Well, that's one way of looking at it, but it's also the time and energy." You talked about your parents driving over the mountains. The Williams sisters, their dad was literally on the court, I don't know how many hours a day, but it was a massive part of his life, just hours. That didn't cost him any money, but it was a huge amount of time that a lot of people don't have to give to their children's game. So then they have to pay for the, the coach to, to do the expensive lessons, right? So can you can you paint that picture a little bit of, of what are the ways to do it and, and how good do you have to be and what, what would it cost to get to that level? Yeah, and and absolutely, there's definitely going to be some costs that go come with it, right? But uh, and the fact that it's an individual sport, um, it it definitely goes it increases the costs because if you do want coaching, tends to be sometimes a little bit more in in a smaller setting, right? Um, but what I would say is, look, if I was to go back and do it all over again, 
I would definitely have stayed, wanted to stay in more multiple sports up to a certain age. Wow. Um, I would have, like, I felt like I burnt out um, because I focused and I was probably too much at too early. And I was really good, really young, but then I burnt out and I kind of, like, gradually, like, fizzled out, right? So uh, I would say, you know, if you're really smart about how you spend your money as, as a tennis parent, it's, it's possible for anybody. Um, and, and what I say about that is, like, Absolutely. Is it worth getting a few technical tennis lessons and mm. um, one-on-one? But I- I've seen players learn their technical strokes from watching YouTube videos. I guess. And, you. you know, and so it all comes down to the kid. If, if the parents having to spend all the money on basically motivating the kid to go and do the lessons, mm. then it's probably going to eventually end up at the stage where the player will probably burn out. Yes. But if, if the parents having to say, sorry, I can't, I can't I can't pay for another lesson today, but I'm, I can bring you to the tennis club and you can arrange a, a match with Jimmy. Then yeah. then now suddenly when they go do take that tennis lesson, it's going to be the, they're going to be like a sponge, right? Yes. So, so I, I think it's all that time. It's like, and look, and it's so crazy is because coaching is not a full-time thing for me that I, I don't depend on that income. I'm able to truly say to the parents, like they don't need a ton of tennis in the lesson this week. They don't need to like, what they need to do is get out of their comfort zone and ask the guy who's a little bit better than them to go go play a set against them, you know? Yeah. That's um, something I wish I did more when I was younger. Ask people above my level to say, listen, let's let's go. Yeah, And, and we're kind of afraid to do that, but it's silly. And and, and, and Fergus, my, my, my parents always, we had enough money and we always did think smart things with our money. And I, mm. I got some lessons, but the time I was 16, I think I took a lesson off own maybe once every own Casey once every two or three months, maybe once every two months. Mm. The rest of them was 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 sparring sessions. And and to be honest, I remember like people like Scott Barron and Own Casey is like I remember like once I got to a certain level, they were they were nice enough to actually even do an hour of me once a week where mm. I'd be sometimes two on one against them with somebody else or um or one on one, you know, and they just they looked out for you, you know, and, and I, I'm actually trying to create that at NACE right now at the moment, like a, a little pyramid system with the juniors of where they're, they're, they're understanding that, OK, if I give back to the person who's slightly below me, but the person yeah. above me gives back to me, then we're all benefiting. And and yeah. and once again, this doesn't have to be one of these ex- expensive sports where nobody should be able to get better at tennis, you know. So can you advertise? Do you mind? Maybe you don't want to do this, but where would be a good place to look if you want your tennis to improve? Uh, at an affordable rate in Ireland. Like it sounds like NACE is, is a, a pot of gold in that sense. In my experience also, I, I think I got great value from, from Westwood Clontarf. Again, maybe you don't want to endorse particular coaches, but I think it's important because you have to know, you have to know how it works. And if you've never, if you're not involved in tennis, you see parents come into tennis and they don't know what they're doing and they're the worst parents on the kids. You know, they put the most pressure and they waste the most money and it, it just doesn't work. So I think the more information we can give people, the better. Do you, do you have any advice specifically where, where you could go? You don't have to answer this question. <laughs> well, I mean, you don't have to say a specific place, but I, you've got to find a, a coach who A, is very energetic, loves the game of tennis, has a passion for teaching it, mm. and, and, and ultimately is going to look out for your kid, right? So I think if you, if you hang around on the side, you know, not too obviously, and just observe one or two sessions as a parent and just say, okay, are, is the kid having fun? Is, is mm-hmm. the kid enjoying himself? Um, is the coach engaging with the player? Um, like, and is the coach giving everything? Like, like, there's been times I've walked off teaching six and seven-year-olds and I'm, I'm spent. I'm <laughs> exhausted. It's way harder to coach a six and seven-year-old than, I... than a 17, 18 year old right? Yeah. Um, and and look, once you find a coach like that, then they're 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 gold, and mm-hmm. they're, we've got loads of them in Ireland. And mm-hmm. I probably shouldn't have sit there and say all the names, but they know who they are. Like, I mean, there's some people with some fantastic attitudes and 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 efforts towards like producing tennis players in our country. Mm-hmm. You know. So then, once you go to America, um, what c- can we talk about? What that might look like financially. So the girls in tennis specifically have more. Uh, the lads kind of have to 
scrap around, maybe find money from other places and and have to, uh, yeah, that's a bit of a, a, a different situation there. So realistically, what's what can you tell parents before they get involved in, in the process? Uh, is it going to cost 5,000, 10,000, 20,000? Uh, nothing. Do you know what, what's, what's it going to cost for someone uh, who wants to go to America for four years to play college tennis? Well, yeah, and this is what I say too is that, okay, everybody criticizes the tennis world for not having enough professional tennis players making a, 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 a good enough living, right? Okay, and it's an absolute tragedy and it's, it's, it needs to get better. But if you look at the overall industry of how many people have created themselves a job from the tennis, from their tennis, it's actually very healthy, mm. right? Um, even I would say it's even probably healthier than even golf pros. How many more tennis pros are in the world making a good living compared to golf pros, right? Or soccer coaches and stuff like that. So the way my mom and dad always approached it, they always said, you, you, you're doing your tennis to basically maximize what you can get out of the sport. And so ultimately, I look back on my, my, my college athletic experience and my degree and all my coaching. I was basically getting a, 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 like a degree in, in, in my job of, uni of, of teaching tennis, right? Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, as a parent, what you're doing is you're creating a skill. Even a skill, like I learned how to string rackets when I was in college. Now, if any time I wanted to string someone else's racket, like I could make 20, 20 euro for stringing their racket, right? So there's so many creative ways that and so many ways that tennis can give back to you where you can make money after you've maybe finished playing tennis that mm. people don't maybe think as much about. So, yeah. so I kind of look back at overall as my overall like college experience and my degree and everything and tennis, everything like that was like I was getting, a, I was getting an education in, in the whole industry. Mm. Um, and I was lucky. I worked for uh, Cliff Drysdale Tennis, which is one of the biggest. Is I think it's the largest management tennis company in the world. I worked for a year and a half before going to college coaching, and that place was incredible. That was the most well-oiled like management tennis company I've ever seen. Like they work operating at all the Cliff Dry uh, the or the Ritz Carlton hotels, all the five-star diamond resorts in America. And you know, I got to coach CEOs of of Bausch and Lam. I got. Um, the peace treaty between Northern Ireland and Ireland. Um, I coached the guy who signed that, the politician from America. I'm drawing a blank on his name now, <laughs> um, which that'll come back to hurt me after not knowing that one. But, but you know, I, I dealt with some crazy, like amazingly successful people. Um, on that island that, where I worked in in in, in Cliff Dysdale Tennis on Key Biscayne, like there was probably like a, maybe 200 Ferraris on that island. Mm. Um, I also got to learn how money didn't make people happy because a lot of the people on that island that were there weren't necessarily that happy. They, they, they took a lot of tennis lessons and they had a lot of nice things, but they were pretty miserable people, some of them, right? So, and I saw some of the people that were really happy with money. So, like, it's kind of one of those things that I knew that I learned so much from tennis. I think that really helped me be happy and content in life too as well, you know? But Mark that's all all of what you said is absolutely true but if if you if your parents do not have the money to pay whatever it costs to go to college that's something you you cannot experience some of the things you experienced so is is it just that someone has to like how can someone get a clear picture of that do, do they have to but, and i want to get to your your job now in a second would they have to work with you in that sense or or can you give us any insight because for all for all I obviously know something about it because I'm a player, but if I wasn't a tennis player, I would have no idea after, after talking to you now, does it cost me more like 5,000 or is it going to be more like 30,000 or is it just completely depends on every situation? Well, it, it all comes down to your value. So, you know, if you're a person who's got, you know, no budget, you've got to find yourself a place where you're extremely valuable to that mm. program. So once again, it's like, you know, there's there's options out there for everybody. It just all depends on your budget. If you obviously okay. gonna go where somewhere where maybe it's a it's a bit of a reach for you, but you've got a larger budget, then maybe the larger budget allows you to be able to to, to obtain it, right? Okay. Um, so, but, and so, but here's the biggest thing: is very like I got I got I got my scholarship reduced um, my third year, and okay. that meant me the summer of my I worked every summer of my of my college. Okay. 
and taught lessons and made money to help pay for my education because my parents gave me a certain percentage of money at the start of the year and they said, right, we're done with that. That's your yeah. money, you go with it, right? And if I spent more or, or didn't spend didn't spend it all, then it was it was the money that they gave to me. At Christmas time, they gave me a little extra money and that was my Christmas present, right? So they taught me how to manage money really well. Now, here's the thing is, is if there's the college season and college in itself only lasts about, I think, 16, 17 weeks a semester. Would that be very correct? Um, see, these days? Say, yeah, that sounds about right. Okay, yeah. so that's, so say 34 weeks of the year, okay? You've got an extra, like say 20, to 18, 20 weeks in there where you've got earning potential. And so for that, some people that might be playing tournaments in the summer and making money from the tournaments, others that might be going out and, and uh, teaching 30, 40 hours a week, you know, that and that can all that money can add up because, you know, coaching tennis, you can make a good, decent bit amount of money, yeah. right? So even hitting with players um, like on the side um, and getting paid that way where you can still develop your game. So I think the money thing is absolutely yes, like fair enough. Tennis costs money to get into and it costs more money, but I think there's more money to be made on as a result of tennis too as well. Yeah. No, I so, think that I, I like how you answer that. And that is true about certainly during the summer, you can either float around the place and, and lie on the beach or you can coach tennis for, for 40 hours a week to, to make a lot of money. Like it's the going rate to, to teach roughly, I think it's fair to say it's around $30 an hour, right? If you're a college player. And yeah. that's a lot if you're doing 40 hours a week. So I think I, I like how you how you dealt with that. There's a way there's a way to do it, basically, uh, if if you really want to. So so your service, your knowledge is greater than I believe. Uh, I suppose more useful, more practical than anyone I've ever met uh, in Ireland or in America and and uh, about college tennis specifically, and I know you're getting into other sports too, but what I, I personally think it's it would be worth getting in touch with you. What would that cost for someone uh, and, and what what kind of service do you provide? Are you, are you able to reveal any of that? Well, so the most important thing is, is I'm not allowed to to guarantee that you give me a figure of money and I'm going to get you a scholarship. OK, because then I'm acting like an agent. Well, and that's why I have to be really, really very, very careful about how I uh, I don't oversell somebody a situation. OK, and um, I can try to look at everybody's individual situation and then say, give them the, the what I think is the best middle and and worst case scenario. Mm. And and ultimately, then what I'm I'm saying is that you're going to be able to to make sure you increase your value if the area you use me, yes. the better. Because in fourth year, there's so many decisions that you can make and spend money certain ways that are gonna come back to help you in two or three years to be more valuable as a recruit. Um, and then also as well as like, just the simple things of like, for I, one person I'm working with, you know, he had a, a very unlucky injury, okay? And um, he's got a lot of value and I think he's going to be a fantastic tennis player and he's going to catch up with people very fast and very quick. But this injury that was very unlucky has now kind of put him a little behind the game, right? Okay. Mm -hmm. So ultimately, I actually ended up helping him be productive in that time of his injury and gave him a new purpose and a new meaning behind that time. Mm -hmm. and, and that really helped him from a mental and emotional standpoint, deal yeah. with the situation that he was in. I and, and, and he's gonna come back way stronger and way better than anyone you'll ever expect because he's actually done something with that time and the productivity, yeah. you know? And, okay. and, that, and that's what this time with the COVID, I've been trying to say to people that I've been working with in this COVID. And you were on that Zoom call the other day we did where mm. we were able to connect the, the current student athletes with the, with the ones that are going over from Ireland. And we're trying to explain the current ones of don't make this mistake, you know, bring this mindset into the college. And because mm. I did this wrong and, 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 and yeah. stuff like that. It's like, and I keep telling people is, is everybody's coming out of this, of, of, of COVID-19, probably 20% worse as a tennis player from a standpoint of hitting a tennis ball. Mm -hmm. 
And I say to them, like, okay, who's co- who the ones coming out mentally and emotionally more resilient um, with better perspective and better mindsets? Because they're going to be ready to play 25% worse by striking the tennis ball. And in turn, when they end up striking the ball the way they want to strike it, they're going to be much stronger competitors. Yeah. And, and, and that's what I'm telling all the people I'm working with right now at the moment is, what are you doing on a daily basis to make sure that when you co- we come out of this, that you're prepared to be ahead of your competition? Mm-hmm. And the biggest thing is I keep telling people is your competition is not the Irish player. Like your competition is the German, the yeah. South American, the Canadian, the American, right? Um, and that's why we have to be kind of forging that still that relationship of, of Irish people of like making sure that we stick together. We're yeah. stronger together and help each other, not not fighting over who's number one in the country. Let's let's make the number one in the country five times better than the number one in the country was five years ago. I get you. No, I I, I love what you're saying. I I, th- I was fascinated listening to you talk to James Cahoon and uh, I hope you don't mind me saying I was actually more interested in his story because I, I kind of knew a bit about you already. And he said he went to Clemson, I think, for one semester and it was just uh, catastrophic. I think that's a dramatic way to put it, but it really didn't work out. And uh, so he 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 said like, oh, if, if I had someone Mark, like you kind of thing, uh, this would have turned out completely, completely differently. So he made mistakes. So many other people make mistakes when they're when they're in college or before they're in college. What are some mistakes, major ones that people fall into uh, in this whole process that you can maybe steer them away from or you would try to do that? Yeah, I mean, I try to get them to focus on the, the coach, the coach uh, and player relationship and you know, for example, is I just had a call with a college coach a couple of days ago, and he hasn't even talked to one of the players who's who's who I'm helping, and he's mm-hmm. already saying he's going to offer this scholarship, and and that he wants her so bad to be on campus, and he's going to be the difference maker in her becoming this, you know. And I'm having to say, whoa, whoa, slow down here, you know, like like this is going to be a three to five phone call like evaluation between you and and the player. And, and that's because, yeah, and that because the, the that's I don't blame him for doing that because that the player for him will be extremely valuable and and will add great value when it comes to like the level that they're bringing in to begin with, um, and then as soon as I start talking to the college coach and I got start saying, look, let's talk about the fit, you know, tell me an example of a player who you've coached uh, yeah. that you've really influenced and that you haven't influenced in a very positive way, and then I learn about the college coach of of okay, does that fit into the Irish player? Um, you know, and so look, I, I think these questions and, and these things like you can only know what to ask the coach once you've been the coach for 11 years. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I've ultimately look, I've made a lot of good decisions and I've made a lot of average decisions. Um, and I look back on my college coaching careers and definitely I would have made some changes. But ultimately, I, I feel good that I, for the most part. I mostly got the right fit of personality, you know? Mm-hmm. And look, and yesterday I had a Zoom call with all of the North Florida team that won the first ever conference championship. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we're all chatting and they're all like abusing me for things I did that were like, like I was like, oh my gosh, did I say that, you know? But like in the moment as the coach, you just, you know, you try your best, right? And, but ultimately these coaches... It's, it's tough to find the right fit. So ultimately, I, mm. my goal is to hopefully try to get them to the player and coach to ask the right questions to get the right fit. And you have players that you've had, like Julian and like others, who are doing really, really well. I, I saw you putting stuff on Facebook about a fella. Was he in the Australian Open final or something? Or, or did, you have, did you have players in, in one of the Grand Slams or something? Or what, what was that? Oh, well, look, you know, once again, is I spent a lot of time with Joe when he was in uh, Joe Salisbury in college tennis. Yeah, he played for Memphis um, in the, the very successful years we had there. And Joe's Joe's come, gone on to do amazing things. He's, you yeah, coached he him? Well, he was, I was his college coach, yeah. So we spent wow. a lot of time on court and stuff like that together. And, and uh, look, you know, J- Joe, I'm not trying to take any credit for Joe winning the Grand Slab. You know, I, I was a small part of, of his journey and, and mm-hmm. he was a really fun guy to coach because he was so open minded. And okay. sometimes, you know, uh, but, you know, Joe is incredible. He, no matter who had been Joe's coach, I think that guy would have found a way to win a yeah. Grand Slam. And, 
Okay. Um, it's it's, so it's won, incredible. He won the doubles at, at the Australian. Was that what it he was? He did, yeah. And he's made semis of Wimbledon doubles too as well. So he's done okay. phenomenal. Um, okay. So, yeah. So, look, but there's loads of other, like, I mean, uh, Irish players like Julian Bradley, Michael Hayes, um, uh, even J he's on the girls' side. I remember Jenny Claffey coming over to do a visit. She never ended up coming to Memphis, which mm -hmm. we were devastated about because we thought she would be the great recruit. Um, who else? Uh, Dara Glavin, who's now a, a college coach. Uh, there's so many Irish that we recruited. Pete Botwell and never ended up coming on campus at North Florida, but mm -hmm. uh, was supposed to come to North Florida. Um, so I, I, I'm really proud. That's actually something I look back on as is almost at all times, David O'Hare, there's just so many Irish people that uh, I was a part of their journey yeah. of, 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 of college tennis. Um, you know, I think at one stage I was thinking Pete, uh, David O'Hare, uh, uh, Julian Bradley, the Davis Cup team there, I was, I wouldn't say three out of four, there was mm -hmm. some connection there of college tennis and me, you know? Yeah, so, that's really cool. That's very special. Yeah, well, very special. That's deadly. How how can someone uh, avail of your services if if they think it's it's something they might consider doing? Yeah, look, I mean, I always do a consultation with 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 everybody just for for thirty minutes, uh, and that's of no charge um, as of right now until I get too busy. <laughs> so, but uh, no, and I I give you an honest evaluation of where where I think you're at and what I think is possible and. Okay. Um, and then after that, um, I basically tell you, you know, these are what my fees are and this is what I think the value is of, of my fees and, well, and uh, then it's up you? to them. There's I mean, no yeah, you can look up, yeah, I'm, I'm everywhere on social media, Mark, uh, dot uh, and then uh, I have a website, but it's not very active because the NCA is, is quite strict with rules on, on our websites. Um, so that's www.allsports.recruitment.com. Um, and then obviously, uh, yeah, you can just get me on email, mark at allsportsrecruitment.com. So, yeah. and, and look, the biggest thing for me is right now is it's going great with tennis players. It's, it's fantastic. Is if you know any other, any other sports, I really think there's a huge benefit of using my service because, you know, the part of, especially the individual sports, like a golf and track and field, where you have individual times and individual scores, it's really irrelevant, that sort of stuff. What's relevant is how you go about the process mm. um, about, once again, creating your value, making sure that you you do all things that will provide you opportunity to get scholarship money. Because as you know, there's more than just athletic scholarship money right. out there, right? And, um, and really on the men's side, especially, that's the most important thing is you maximize out the um, about about uh, uh, maximize those type of things out there, right? So and things and you need to prepare for that in advance, like things like SATs. You, there's a, a big range of what you can do. This if you rock up or you can prepare. And same with the leaving cert. Obviously, there's a lot to. Well, the leaving cert doesn't matter so much, but there's a lot to know before uh, that that you can share with people. So anyway, thanks a million uh, for talking to me today. And uh, well, Fergus, and, it's Fergus just. Yeah, Fergus, real quickly, just want to say is it's so good to that you're you're happy in your new home and, mm. and you're a guy, you're an interesting transfer case because it wasn't like you weren't happy in your coach and mm. you had a great relationship. But ultimately, that wasn't what you were looking for, right? Out of mm. your experience, you were looking for somewhere where you'd actually contribute in the lineup. Mm. And that was the most important thing for you. So I'm hoping that we found you a good fit. Yeah. And that you're happier now because you're getting to get something back from your college experience in terms of competing. Um, and look, once again, is I think, Fergus, we'll have a relationship probably for the rest of our life, right? Yeah. And um, that's the biggest thing I say about the services. There's a lot of recruitment agencies out there and their goal is to get you a scholarship. My mm -hmm. goal is not. It's not why I did that. My goal is to get you a scholarship and that's part of the, the process. But my goal is actually to have a meaningful relationship where hopefully we help create opportunity for you in in many aspects of of your mm. life before and after college, right? Yeah. So no, that's that's fair to say, and and you have you've been true to your word, I must say. Uh, and I can yeah. see you doing that with everyone else. So that's that's really really cool to see, because I think I was one of the first clients of you, yours. You were, and it wasn't. It was so funny because you know I had no idea who your your family was. 
Yeah. And um, and it really was, and not that anyone's defined by their family, but yeah. later did I realize that your family was like, like geez, that's a lot of pressure. <laughs> <laughs> I want to make sure I deliver on that. <laughs> that's funny, yeah. No, my so, people are very, very scared of my mum, funnily enough. So you, you handled her. She, she was, she's been impressed too. So uh, <laughs> anyway. Well, I, I've a lot, I've actually, over the process, I've really enjoyed talking to your mom and uh, she, she loves you very, very dearly. I'll just tell you that. And so does your sisters. So. Oh yeah, you, you worked with Ashling too. That's, that's true. That's, yeah. Yeah. When things got a little tricky, then we went to this, we brought the sister in too as well, right? <laughs> no, I, I'm, not a, I'm not easy to work with, Mark. So no, it's, um, anyway, if you can handle that, I'm sure you can, you'll, you'll do fine with everyone else. Thanks a million and, and good luck with the virus and everything and the Thanks. kids and all that. Yeah, stay safe, Fergus. See you, mate. Good talking to you.